Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorised into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water or secret. In this series I'll be going through and analysing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video we're going to be looking at the grass element, home to the ornithopod dinosaurs, including the famous hadrosaurs as well as several of their more obscure relatives. Their move cards often consist of either summoning plants to alter the health of other dinosaurs or summoning other creatures entirely, perhaps to symbolise a synergy and or connection with nature. I'll be honest, I've never liked the name grass for the element, since grass wasn't widespread during the age of dinosaurs, nor had even evolved at all for a good chunk of it. The fact the element's ultimate move card is called Ultimate Leaf makes me wish it was called Leaf instead, as it's a more encompassing plant-based title, but eh, let's just get to the dinosaurs. When it comes to ornithopods, all were at least facultatively, and some even wholly, bipedal, as in walked on two legs. As far as I can tell, all members had five fingers, which all Dinosaur King models do have, all with claws, but like all archosaurs, should only have claws on the first three digits. The more basal members of the group have their wrists pronated, which they couldn't do, as they should now have their palms facing each other. Something I forgot to talk about in my videos covering the lightning and earth elements, is how it's debated whether Ornithischian dinosaurs had cheeks like those seen in the Dinosaur King models for holding food in the mouth, or whether they just had lizard-like lips. As this theory has only gained widespread attention in recent years, and is still heavily debated, I won't critique these models for being reconstructed with cheeks, nor any of the other Ornithischians in the franchise. I will however critique the cheeks for extending too far to the front of the mouth, as this trait is only seen in mammals for suckling. The first grass dinosaur we're going to look at is Mutaburrosaurus. Its name means Mutaburra lizard after the town of the same name in Queensland, Australia, near to where it was first discovered, in rock dated to the early Cretaceous, roughly 112 to 103 million years ago. Whilst frequently reconstructed very similarly to Iguanodon, who we'll talk about in a little bit, more recent research has shown that this genus was only distantly related to it. The head looks spot on to the skull, with its distinct bulbous bony mass at the tip of the snout. Whilst the hands are unknown, it's often given Iguanodon's signature thumb spikes, even though it most likely didn't have them. It's also portrayed as a facultative quadruped, but is now thought to have been exclusively bipedal. It also only has three toes, but as a more basal ornithopod, it should have four, with the first toe as a dew claw. On the whole, this model is sadly quite outdated. Next is Camptosaurus. Its name means flexible lizard, and it lived in North America during the late Jurassic, roughly 155 to 150 million years ago. This genus has a complicated taxonomic history, with many specimens referred to it being moved to other genera. One of these genera is Theophytalia, named in 2006, whose skull was often placed on the body of Camptosaurus in museum mounts. It had a much longer and rectangular head than those confidently referred to Camptosaurus, which had a much more triangular shape. The head on this model seems to be based on the skull now referred to Theophytalia, unfortunately. It is also portrayed as a facultative quadruped when it is now thought to be exclusively bipedal. It does have the correct number of toes though with four, the first being a dewclaw. Sadly, this model too is quite outdated. Up next we have the second dinosaur genus ever to be named, Iguanodon. Its name means iguana tooth and it lived in Europe during the early Cretaceous, roughly 125 million years ago. Putting the rich history of Iguanodon's reconstructions over almost two centuries aside, this model is nearly perfect for the time. 
The head looks to perfectly match the skull. However, the forelimbs might be too slim by modern standards. Many species once referred to the genus Iguanodon have since been given their own distinct genus names, one of which being Mantellisaurus in 2007, which had much slimmer forelimbs compared to Iguanodon. And so this may be what this model was based on. Whilst it was a facultative biped, Iguanodon was thought to mainly walk on all fours, but unlike the later Hadrosaurids, it couldn't pronate its wrists when walking on its hands as is seen here. It is correctly shown to walk on the second, third and fourth fingers, even though the fourth shouldn't have a claw. The fifth finger is appropriately long and prehensile for grasping foliage and is correctly shown being held off the ground whilst on all fours. Its famous thumb claws are reconstructed as quite small here. This is probably due to them either being based on material now referred to Mantellisaurus, which had thumb claws much smaller than those of Iguanodon, or they are the smaller morph of thumb spikes seen in Iguanodon, which some researchers consider individual variation and others consider consider sexual dimorphism. If it's the latter, something interesting to note is that the Iguanodon in the anime is male, yet appears to have the smaller quote-unquote female morph of thumb spike. This is the first ornithopod we've looked at so far to have three toes, which will be the case with all of them going forward, so I won't point it out anymore. Whilst it is a bit outdated now, for the time this is fantastic. Next we have Altirhinus. Its name means high snout and it lived in Mongolia during the early Cretaceous, roughly 120 million years ago. It essentially looked like a guanodon but with a large nasal crest, so much so it was originally thought to be a species of a guanodon, I. orientalis, when it was first described in 1952, until being given its own genus name in 1998. In essence, everything I said about Iguanodon also applies here, as their anatomy is extremely similar. As for its distinct head, this model has a more solid looking crest than what the skull would suggest. It has been speculated that the nasal crest anchored inflatable sacs the animal would use for display or vocalising in life. On the whole, this is a solid reconstruction of Altirhinus. Next we have Lanchosaurus. Its name means Lancia Lizard, after the city of the same name in China near to where it was discovered, in rock dated to the early Cretaceous, roughly 130 million years ago. It is only known from a single, mostly incomplete specimen. As such, most of the body is speculative and reconstructed based on more complete, closely related ornithopods, such as Iguanodon. Among the known material is the lower jaw, which preserves some of the largest teeth of any herbivore to ever live. The rest of the body is essentially that of Iguanodon, as most of Lanchosaurus's anatomy is unknown. As such, I can't really comment on its accuracy, but I think making it similar to the fairly closely related Iguanodon was a sensible choice. Next we have Fuquisaurus. Its name means Fuqui Lizard, after the Fuqui Prefecture in Japan where it was discovered in rocks dated to the early Cretaceous, roughly 125 million years ago. The head perfectly reflects the known skull material. The anatomy of the rest of the animal's body was also very similar to Iguanodon, but with thinner forelimbs. As such, I don't really have much to say about it, but that's a good thing, as for the time, this model is essentially a perfect representation of Fuquisaurus. The last of the more basal ornithopods is Oranosaurus. Its name means Brave Lizard, and it lived in Africa during the early Cretaceous, roughly 115 million years ago. Its skull had a distinct raised bump between its eyes that sloped down to the end of the snout. This is accurately reconstructed in the model. Its forelimbs were also very similar to those of Iguanodon. Oranosaurus's most distinct trait was the sail on its back. Here it is portrayed as a thin skin layer over the vertebrae, similar to the sail of Spinosaurus, however it may have instead supported a fatty hump, similar to camels or bison. Due to the lack of clarity on the purpose of its sail, it's hard to comment on accuracy for this aspect of the animal, but the general anatomy is excellent. 
We've now reached the Hadrosaurids of the late Cretaceous, and honestly, I don't really have much to say about most of them, as for the time, they're generally all really good. With a few exceptions, the majority of their issues are universal across the board. Their snouts end where the skull does, and the beak is incorporated into the snout tip. However, we now know their beaks actually have a distinct demarcation from the skin on the head. They should also be sharper and deflect downwards. Another aspect are their forelimbs. Hadrosaurs had lost their first finger, which is correctly shown on the models. However, their fingers are shown as independent functional units. Three of the fingers were all encased in skin and acted as a single unit, with the last digit being vestigial. Years later, with the discovery of the mummified specimen of Edmontosaurus named Dakota having a hoof covering the three walking digits on the hands, it can be inferred that all hadrosaurs may have had them, unless we find evidence to the contrary. Newer research has also found that the neural spines on hadrosaur neck vertebrae most likely supported huge neck muscles, so the thin necks of the Dinosaur King models are now probably outdated too. The family Hadrosauridae can be divided into two subfamilies, the Sorolophines, with more conservative head adornments, and the Lambiosaurines, which often had quite extravagant head crests. The first of the Sorolophines we're going to look at is Brachylophosaurus. It lived in North America from 80 to 76 million years ago. Its name means short crested lizard, and appropriately, its head is restored with the distinct flat crest at the back of the top of its head. I honestly have nothing more to add. It's great, simple as that. The next genus is the closely related Myosaura. It lived in North America roughly 76 million years ago. Its name means good mother lizard, as an entire nesting site was found representing several growth stages of this genus and that the mothers cared for their young after they hatched. This was referenced in the anime as it showed a mother protecting its baby, which I think was a cool nod to this. It has the distinct raised ridge between its eyes reconstructed perfectly. Another wonderful model. Next we have the subfamily's namesake genus, Sorolophus. Its name means lizard crest, and it is one of the very few dinosaurs known from multiple continents. The type species, S. osborni, is known from North America, and S. angustirostris is known from Asia, both living roughly 70 million years ago. Based on the distinct bumpy ridge along the back, the model seems to represent S. angustirostris. In the anime, there are actually two Sorolophus, one with an orange crest and one with a green crest. Whilst unconfirmed, many fans assume one to be male and one to be female, with the colour difference being sexual dimorphism, which would be really cool. On the whole, this model is solid. Next is Prosorolophus. It lived in North America roughly 75 million years ago, and its name means before Sorolophus, due to its similarity to said genus in terms of its head crest, which is reconstructed perfectly here, as well as being older geologically and closely related to it. Once again, I don't have much to say, as the model is superb. Up next we have a slightly complicated genus, Edmontosaurus. Its name means Edmonton Lizard, after the Canadian town near where it was discovered in rock dated to roughly 73 million years ago. The model labelled Edmontosaurus in Dinosaur King most likely represents E. regalis, and we'll discuss why in just a moment. For the time, it is basically perfect. However, whilst Edmontosaurus lacks the elaborate bony crest of its relatives, this species is now known to have had a fleshy head comb, similar to a rooster. Overall, this model is really good. The reason I believe it is E. regalis is that next we have Anatotitan, meaning Titanic duck. It also lived in North America from 68 to 66 million years ago. This animal has a complex taxonomic history, however, it is now seen as a species of Edmontosaurus e. anectens. This species lacked the head comb and had a longer skull, the longest of any hadrosaur in fact. 
which is reflected in this model. Aside from the weird taxonomy, for the time, it's also pretty good. The last Sorolophene is the largest ornithopod ever discovered, Shantungosaurus. Its name means Shandong Lizard, after the province in China where it was discovered in rock dated to roughly 75 million years ago. Despite living in Asia, it is thought to be closely related to the North American Edmontosaurus, and as such, due to being incompletely known, most of its body is reconstructed based on its more well-known relative. This animal oddly appears to have a more modern reconstruction of hadrosaur beaks, though still not quite right in this regard, as it should probably extend further up the snout. This might be the best hadrosaur model in the franchise. It is fantastic. The first of the Lambiosaurines we'll be looking at is Xintaosaurus. Its name means Xintao Lizard, after the town of Qingtao in China, near to where it was discovered, in rock dated to roughly 75 million years ago. This is the only hadrosaur in the franchise whose crest is now outdated, whilst long thought to have had a unicorn-like straight head crest. In 2013, a specimen preserving the front of the skull showed that this was only the rear part of a larger crest, more typical of other other Lambiosaurines. Whilst now outdated, for the time, it's still great. Next, we have one of the most famous members, Parasaurolophus, aka Paris from the anime. Its name means near Sorolophus, as when it was first discovered in 1922, it was thought to be closely related to Sorolophus due to them both having tall head crests. Ironically, the two are not actually that closely related. It lived in North America roughly 75 million years ago, and possibly also Asia, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Several species are known, but this model seems to represent the type species P. walkeri, as it had the long head crest, which is reconstructed perfectly here. It's speculated that the hollow nasal passages within its crest were used for communicating with one another. Paris is actually shown to use this ability in the anime, but in an offensive manner to deafen opponents. I don't know how reasonable that is, but it's cool, I guess. Regardless, the model is wonderful. Up next we have Coronosaurus. Its name means Charon Lizard, after the figure from Greek mythology. It lived in China roughly 68 million years ago. As you can probably tell, it was extremely similar to Parasaurolophus, so much so that some researchers consider it an Asian species, Parasaurolophus giaunensis. As such, the model is almost identical to that of Parasaurolophus, but with a brown colour scheme instead of green, and a speculative skin membrane connecting the crest to the neck. This has been proposed for Parasaurolophus in the past, but the recent interpretation of the neck vertebrae anchoring huge neck muscles has casted doubt on this hypothesis. On the whole though, it's about as good as the Parasaurolophus. Up next is Aloro Titan. Its name means Titanic Swan, after its long neck for a hadrosaur. It lived in Russia roughly 70 million years ago. Its hatchet-shaped head crest is reconstructed perfectly, and I genuinely don't have any more to say on it other than it's wonderful. It's a very similar case with Carithosaurus. It lived in Canada around 76 million years ago. Its name means helmeted lizard, as its tall round head crest resembles a Corinthian helmet. Its head crest is reconstructed perfectly for the type species C. casuarius, and again, I have nothing more to say other than it's fantastic. The last Lambiosaurine and grass dinosaur is the subfamily's namesake, Lambiosaurus. It lived in Canada roughly 75 million years ago. Its name means Lamb's Lizard, after the prolific 19th and 20th century Canadian paleontologist Lawrence Lamb. Not counting any possible synonyms, Lambiosaurus is one of the very few genera in Dinosaur King to have multiple species portrayed. The type species L. lambii and its distinct hatchet-shaped or thumbs-up shaped crest looks to be reconstructed slightly wrong here. The handle of the hatchet, if you will, is shown to jut out of the back of the head when it should project backwards from the blade on top of the head. 
The second species, L. magnacristatus, has a much rounder crest, very similar to that of Corythosaurus, but having a small bulge at the front. This species' crest is perfectly reconstructed, so it does come out ahead of its sister taxon. Dinosaur King's grass element is definitely showing its age in terms of accuracy, as by modern standards they have quite a few issues across the board, especially the more basal members. However, for the time, they are mostly stellar, especially the hadrosaurs, perhaps even the most accurate of the main six elements. But again, I must emphasize, for the time. I'd like to thank my good friend, The Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow Paleo YouTuber, The Casual Prince Ace, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.